Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea Samados. Um, I will be facilitating the discussion today. I'm a PhD student here at the Oxford Internet Institute. I'm working on AI and cybersecurity. And on the side, I'm also working on uh, open source software for file sharing called Filers. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, uh, to this panel discussion on Internet freedom information communication, accessibility, and archiving. We'll discuss a lot of things today, including censorship resistance, human rights, digital rights, uh, and so on. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here, uh, especially after a long day of uh, striking for better pay and working conditions across the UK. I know some colleagues of mine just, uh, just finished and are joining uh, the call. I thought I would briefly introduce the amazing panel of speakers we have today, and then just a general uh, structure of today's discussion, and then keep as quiet as possible so that we can all hear who, who we are here to listen to. So we have uh, Mark Graham uh, on the call today. Uh, he is the director of the Wayback Machine at the Internet Archive. I like to tell people that the Internet Archive is. Um, the researcher's best friend. It allows you to archive information, uh, archive whole uh, web pages, uh, find information that has usually disappeared from the web, etc. We have uh, Roger on the call, who is a computer scientist, uh, also known as Arma online, and uh, known for having co-founded the Tor project. The Tor project, for those of you who don't know, develops and maintains the Tor browser system, also known as the Onion Router. It's a free and open source and sophisticated privacy tool that provides anonymity for your uh, everyday web surfing and communications. Uh, we have uh, Nathalie Cadranel. Uh, Nathalie is a founder and executive director of Open Archive. Open Archive is a free and open source project uh, for those who are managing sensitive mobile media. It leverages actually the, the efforts of the Internet Archive and Tor and the Guardian project, uh, for example, to bring to life what they call radical archiving. So for preserving, amplifying, and securely routing mobile media to community maintained collections and accessible public and private archives. We have uh, Sam Williams, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Arweave. It's a new data, relatively new uh, data uh, storage protocol on a blockchain-like structure called the uh, Blockweave. Arweave enables you to store data, applications, and documents forever, which is, I know, a big statement, but we'll, we'll get probably in the details of how that works. Um, and we have uh, Laurie Rousset, uh, who uh, works as the data protection lead and officer at Oxfam International, and is really on the front lines of protecting the human rights of uh, persecuted uh, people around the globe. And she's uh, also the co-founder of Data Rights, a new nonprofit organization that defends, defends, uh, enforces, and advances data rights. So I just wanted to give this uh, general introduction of the speakers. Now the discussion will run for about an hour, followed by a Q&A of 30 minutes at the end. Please feel free to put your questions already in the comment section on your screen. I'll do my best to include them uh, throughout the discussion, but mainly towards the end. And for your awareness, um, please note that this event will be recorded and will be posted on our uh, website, the website of the department uh, following the event. Now, Last little uh, words just to connect the, the topics and then uh, we move on to the introductions. Um, you might have thought maybe from the diversity of topics represented by this panel that it was organized by someone wondering if they could put together their dream group of people to have a discussion on internet freedom. 
And you would not be completely wrong uh, to think that uh, because really each person on the panel today has contributed to making the internet more robust, to protecting human rights and ensuring that people can safely and reliably uh, access important knowledge and information and communicate it. So specifically what I hope we can show uh, with today's discussion is that there are many layers and types of involvement needed to improve the state of internet freedom. And here their contribution uh, contributions range from making protocols and tools for developers to build on or setting up decentralized uh, networks. So this concerns maybe more Tor and Arweave. Um, helping individuals to preserve and access important information. This is a work of Open Archive and Internet Archive, and even uh, litigating in the name of open and privacy preserving technology, which is a work that Lori does at uh, Data Rights. So if there was ever a group to discuss the current state of Internet freedom and how we can collectively work to improve it, this is it. Uh, and this is why I'm very excited for this. Um, and specifically, I hope we can discuss some of your worries about the state of the internet, initiatives you are hopeful about, uh, the sustainability of projects that work in nonprofit um, models, etc. So now, without further ado, um, I was intentionally short with the introductions of the panelists because I think it would be better uh, to hear from you directly and uh, about what has motivated uh, your work in your current projects. So maybe Mark, if you could, uh, could set us off. Okay. Great, yeah, uh, but my worries about the state of the internet. Okay, uh, that's uh, uh, challenging. Uh, but for those of us at uh, Oxford Institute, I'm the other Mark Graham, um, the less famous Mark Graham, and uh, maybe one of these days I'll meet the other Mark Graham. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. And, uh, and okay, and do the present thing. I'm gonna quickly cruise through a presentation. Okay, uh, at, at, we were asked about the motivation. The motivation is universal access to all knowledge. The Internet Archive is a 27-year-old nonprofit based in San Francisco. This is our headquarters. Uh, we, we bought the building because it matched our logo. Uh, there's about 150 people that work for the organization. And uh, if I can get my mouse here to move, and why won't, uh, there we go. Uh, we're probably best known for the Wayback Machine. It's a project that I that I, I manage. Uh, our, the mission of the Wayback Machine is to help make the web more useful and reliable. One of the ways we do that is by archiving a lot of the public web. Uh, more than 1 billion, something close to 1.5 billion URLs a day. We don't do that by ourselves. We do it in collaboration with many, many partners. Uh, there are literally more than 10,000 separate uh, simultaneous processes that are running on any given day uh, that are archiving uh, much of the public web. Uh, one of those is Save Page Now, our web.archive.org slash save. Anyone can put in a URL. This uh, is responsible for something like 30 million uh, archived URLs every single day. Uh, there are multiple interfaces, uh, Google Sheets for bulk uh, submission APIs, uh, et cetera. And yes, we do have browser extensions for all of the major browsers. Uh, I won't spend much time on this, but this browser extension is really a Swiss army knife of uh, functionality, uh, including things like context and, and re re related information, uh, as well as the standard uh, fare you'd expect from the Wayback machine. Very quickly, things numbers get pretty uh, big in, in, in the web. W one seed URL, uh, if you do one hop on it, can equal 31,000 URLs to archive. So uh, these are the, some of the numbers that we deal with. And when we get up to the numbers like billions, you know, we like to say, if you see something, save something. If you see something like, for example, when MH17 was shot down, uh, the, a, a separatist uh, posted this on VK, a Russian social media site, claiming responsibility for shooting down uh, an aircraft. And you can see the smoke in the background. 
Uh, it turns out the person who posted that was one of the people who was found guilty uh, in a Dutch court uh, many, many years later. As far as we know, the, this in the Wayback Machine is the only archive of that particular post. It was taken down off of VK. I also know, uh, you know, here in, in the United States, we had a, an insurrection. An, a, 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 an attempted insurrection. There was a big committee report about it uh, that when we had a new Congress, they took down uh, all the, the information uh, from the, the, the prior Congress. And uh, as far as we can tell, this is the only archive of an interactive timeline of what happened on January 6, which was produced by the 117th Congress. Uh, here's another example of how we, we're, we're useful. Uh, this is an article in Lenta. Uh, well, an uh, article in Medusa about when Lenta.ru uh, uh, was taken over by some brave journalists who posted about 21 anti war uh, articles. Uh, and uh, and then, of course, they were taken offline very quickly, uh, but not before we had archived all of those articles. There are a number of tools and utilities in the Wayback Machine. I was asked to make this presentation practical, tools you can use. Uh, so here, here goes. Uh, here's one where you can do comparisons of two archives side by side and highlight the differences in yellow and in blue. Uh, this is a series, uh, 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 one example of full text search that we're building on top of many of our archives. This one happens to be um, for the, uh, the 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 news organization uh, Apple Daily, uh, which was shut down by the uh, Hong Kong, uh, in Hong Kong, and we have like 3.3 million articles here from Apple Daily. And I searched for the word freedom and got 4,000 results. I know that the the journalists from Apple Daily. And also the Stan News are using these archives as the only way they can access their articles because they were shut down. Uh, we, we collect academic journal articles, uh, close to 30 million so far that are uh, all open. And these are all completely uh, available via the Wayback Machine. In addition to the web, so the Internet Archive, universal access to all knowledge, we work with the web, we work with books and music and movies and radio and television and microfiche and microfilm, etc. Um, when the war started uh, in U Ukraine, uh, we began archiving Russian, uh, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and, and other uh, television. We're, we're kind of focusing right now on state television uh, in authoritarian governments. And we now, as of a couple of weeks ago, are offering near real time English language closed caption on top of Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian television. Uh, so it, it, it's beginning to answer the question that I had, which was, I wonder what Russians are watching on television. I don't speak Russian, but now through the Internet Archive, in collaboration with uh, gdeltproject.org, you can actually uh, uh, answer that question. We have more than 7 million books available. We digitize about 3,000 books every single day. That's a shipping container of books every two weeks. Uh, and what can we do with those books? In addition to people being able to borrow them and read them, we worked actively to add links to those books in Wikipedia articles. There are now more than 2 million um, links in Wikipedia articles going back to uh, books from archive.org. And we've added most of those links ourselves uh, with ro robotic software. Uh, please come visit us. This is what the inside of our church looks like. It was a former Church of Christian Scientists. That's Edward Snowden there. I guess he came and visited us virtually uh, one one day. But we uh, we love hosting events, uh, book book events, and and other gatherings um, uh, in our in our facility. And I am simply Mark at archive.org, and I'd love to mix it up with the the rest of you uh, after the presentations. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. This was really great. Uh, and a few functionalities of the, the um, browser extension that I didn't know of, actually, and I really highly recommend it for everyone uh, here today. It's one of my favorite tools on my browser. I go, I click, I, I save any, any type of, uh, of website that uh, I'm attached to. So very good, uh, very good extension. Um, now we'll move on to the, the next speaker. Uh, I think, uh, Lori, we had, uh, we had, uh, discussed maybe you going second, if you're, if you can. Sounds good. That sounds good. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mark. Um, 
I can echo what uh, Andrea said. There are some features that I didn't know about. So thank you so much for this. Um, it's quite humbling to, uh, to go after you. Uh, I don't have a presentation. Uh, I think one of the reasons for this is because when you deal with, uh, with legal stuff and litigation, you very quickly come across as quite boring when you have a presentation. So I guess this is uh, something that I'm starting to fight. Uh, but yeah, so no presentation for me. Uh, so my name is Laurie Rousey. I am a specialist in data protection law, specialized in primarily EU law, um, data protection law and intelligence law. And so, as Andrea said, I'm um, sharing my time between working in the humanitarian sector uh, for Oxfam, which, uh, which means activities ranging from supporting programs to policy work around how to make um, the most disempowered uh, get more agency around the use of their data. Um, my work ranges from um, pushing back on requests from authorities and the UN to gain uh, access to raw um, safeguarding and investigation data to um, pushing or, or making sure that uh, some of these very disempowered people like victims of genocide um, get to actually get a better picture of what exactly we're doing with their data so that uh, this is the first building block for them to actually demand accountability. Um, but this is not what's most relevant for us today. So the other side of my activities is my work with, uh, with Data Rights. So Data Rights is, a, is an organization that, um, that is really bringing together cybersecurity specialists, uh, data protection specialists, and so, our vision is to fight against um, state, but also corporate surveillance and data abuse. Um, that said, we're also really passionate about ways to build a solid digital economy. And so that usually involves being passionate with data interoperability and decentralization. So just, um, just to, yeah, just to stress that. Um, I'm going to give you uh, practical examples of where, um, where I've started with my activities and where we're going. Um, <clears throat> so the, the activities that, um, that led to this started in 2015. Uh, in Paris, you had many attacks, including one news uh, article, well, sorry, not article, uh, newspaper, Charlie Hebdo. Uh, where there has been terrorist attacks and then more terrorist attacks during the year. Uh, long story short, the government uh, ha hurried to pass on what we could say is the French equivalent of the Patriot Act. And so with a group of other people, we chose to actually go after that rule, that, that bill, to actually make sure that there would be some democratic oversight around certain of the measures that were being pushed for. Um, and so this is this is what we started working on. Um, almost a year later, we were ready to file the case. And before we actually filed the case, we paused the case because we realized that um, there was an article um, in already existing laws that said any of the regulation sets uh, would actually not be applying on uh, what was called Hertzian waves. Uh, because we were primarily people with legal backgrounds, we thought, well, I don't really understand this, so surely this is not prob probably not so important. Uh, but then comes this day, we're about to file, and we think, well, unless it is important. And then someone technical said, well, actually, this is all about wireless communications. So, you know, Wi-Fi connections uh, between a phone, a computer, a tablet. Um, uh, satellite communications, um, communications between a, um, a well, any payment system and, uh, and a machine. So anyways, the, 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 the exhaustive list is on our website, uh, datarights.ngo. But yeah, that was, that was striking. So then before we even started the case, we actually had to pause and go to the Constitutional Council to even ask if this was even possible in a functioning democracy. Now, the political pressure was huge on the Constitutional Council, but uh, actually, yes, we won. This was a loophole that was way too broad to be acceptable in a democracy. Then uh, we resumed with the case and uh, that enabled us to reach the highest EU court where we actually got our case joined up with uh, a case from Privacy International. 
Uh, so this was in uh, 2019. One of us actually was the attorney of Privacy International uh, in that joined up case. And so in 2020, we won uh, one very critical aspect, if you ask me, which is um, we obtained that people now need to be informed after they have been subject to secret surveillance in the EU, uh, which is something quite fundamental. And I'm going to come back on, on this, actually, because I really like your question, Andreas, about why we're doing this. And um, yeah, uh, I'm going to come back on this. And now our activities, I'm not going to talk too much about the prison cases because it's, uh, it's quite confidential, but we're moving more towards nuanced, more nuanced cases. So typically this is taking us more towards uh, public private partnerships. How much, how much is a government or an authority actually leaving, let's just say the dirty work to, um, to a company. And then when people are seeking for accountability that the company looks very surprised and says, well, uh, this is, these are not purposes that, uh, that are mine anyways. Um, technically also, this is more nuanced. Um, it, these used to be fairly straightforward in the previous cases. And now we actually go to experts and they have no idea what businesses are doing with the data. So they're trying to, yeah, to do guesswork. So this is, this is pretty much where we are um, right now with data rights. And um, Andreas, I, yeah, your question, what motivated you? So typically, um, for me, these are, you know, how to make sure that we have sound counterpowers in a democracy. Uh, functioning democracy needs to have counterpowers. Journalists, uh, individuals that actually seek accountability from uh, from entities, um, well, administrations. And um, one of the other motivations actually is I like this sentence, which is you can judge the level of um, civil, civil, well, the quality of a civilization based on how it treats the most vulnerable. And this is something that really struck us when we were doing these cases because we kept on receiving messages from people that were convinced that they were under secret surveillance. And it was heartbreaking to answer and say, well, we have no idea, but you can probably assume you're not, uh, but we couldn't, we couldn't really help them. Whereas now, um, having obtained this right for people to actually be informed from the moment they're no longer concerned, considered to be uh, dangerous, mm -hmm. this is actually helpful because we could tell people, well, unless you have received a letter, you have never been, and you know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Laurie. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't try to uh, cut you off. I was just uh, responding uh, out, out loud. Uh, it's really something that I'll try to relate back with the rest of the discussion. But uh, here we have, I think, mainly uh, um, people that have built a tool or a technology and really helped uh, uh, through technological development. And to see your work coming in from the point of view of litigation. And enabling and making sure that you know privacy preserving uh, tools or just uh, the ability to preserve information for a long time within the boundaries of the law it's people like you that do this work so uh, it's uh, fundamental to what we're going to hear next um sam uh, if you can uh, go next hi yes uh, can you hear me okay yes absolutely excellent perfect thank you all right, so uh, can you see the slides okay? Yep, yep. Okay, great. So um, yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to be surrounded by such, I would say, distinguished <laughs> uh, panel participants. So thank you for that. It's an honor to be here. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about are we? I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Hopefully there should be five minutes, but maybe 10. <laughs> okay, so uh, Arweave is a permanent data storage ledger. It's built on the same principles as a blockchain, but we saw that actually the, the first use of a blockchain was to store data, not to settle transactions. In the first block of Bitcoin, Satoshi embedded the headline of the Times newspaper in the UK um, said, you know, the, I think there's Chancellor on the brink of a uh, second bailout for banks, which is, which is interesting because 
what, what they did by doing this was embed a record of history inside a cryptographically secured and um, globally distributed ledger. So I'm not sure how many copies of this piece of information there are right now, but I think it's fair to say probably hundreds of thousands, if not, yeah, probably I'd say somewhere between 100,000 and 400,000 copies of that piece of data. But that's really interesting because if you're trying to store a record of history that doesn't get forgotten, it's very clear that, that embedding it in this sort of uh, blockchain mining mechanism is actually a pretty sensible way of doing that. Um, because it replicates it in so many places around the world that people need to, um, yes, those, those replicas are necessary in order for people to take part in this mining process that they get paid for. And so you sort of use this selfish incentive they have to make money to have this pro-social output, which is you know, recording data. The, the problem, of course, with, block, with Bitcoin and, and blockchains in the, the, I'd say the first generation was that they, they didn't store very much data. So um, I think Bitcoin goes at a rate of approximately one megabyte of new data per 10 minutes. And this means that if today you wanted to store just this you know, newspaper headline, uh, you would actually have to pay quite a significant amount of money to do so. So uh, we got started building Arweave in about 20, so early 2017, about six years now. Um, and we were, we were sort of motivated by this fact that we looked around the world and we saw that the, I would say the, the world was becoming increasingly at least destabilized, if not increasingly authoritarian. And particularly and concerningly, I, I felt personally as, as where I lived, I, I felt that was happening in the West as well as elsewhere, which was novel. I mean, I'm, I'm 30 years old now and at the time I was 24 or something. And uh, I had not seen that before. And I, <laughs> the people I spoke to hadn't seen that before. And, and so I thought this was, you know, this was quite a concerning trend and that the best time to build something that, that might, you know, at least make that slight bit harder was before it was a major concern or before a, a pressing concern, let's say. Um, yes, and so, so we got started and we realized, okay, well, you can take a blockchain and, and you can use it to create a sort of new library of Alexandria, but it can never burn down because it's replicated in so many different places and the government can never come and say, hey, please destroy these records because no single person controls the records uh, as long as you could solve uh, two problems. So essentially the, the issues are sustainability. When you put a piece of data into Bitcoin, there's actually no specific incentive that people need to replicate it. They generally do because it's not a large amount of data at the moment. But if it did become a large amount of data, they could um, prune that, that, that transaction data from the data set. You wouldn't have to store it locally. Uh, which is a bit of a problem. And then there's technical scalability. So again, Bitcoin does one megabyte every 10 minutes. That's very obviously not enough. So we wanted to solve those problems. And what we came up with was this system, Arweave, um, that is more a platform for creating archives than it is uh, for, would you say, being an archive itself. So the idea is that we can say, okay, well, we'll create a transparent, sustainable, business model for running an archive that is, is operating in a decentralized way so you don't need to trust anyone to execute it. And then you can add your own archives of data on top. And that, that is how it's largely been deployed in practice. We're not, uh, you know, unlike the, the internet archive, which is doing a fantastic job of basically hoovering up all the data from the web, we see our, our job is on the other side saying, okay, can we build a hard drive that never forgets that could be deployed by many people, including the internet archive if they wanted to, but, you know, all sorts of people across the world archiving whatever they thought was relevant to pay for the storage of. Uh, so the first task that we had was to solve scalability. Um, we do this by essentially swapping out the uh, mining process that you find in Bitcoin, which is really just wasting energy. It's like a competition, uh, <laughs> a diabolical, frankly, competition for who can waste the most energy. We replace that with, okay, who can replicate the data set as many times as possible? And, and so as a result of this, we've, we have approximately, I think, somewhere between 400 and 800 replicas of the Arweave data set right now. Uh, it fluctuates day by day, but, but it's normally in that range. And that means that, um, yes, it's quite a powerful system. You can put data into it and it's replicated in many, many places across the world. So it's really very, very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to scrub. Oh, and another part of this is, is we disentangle the data storage itself from the transaction data. But this, I guess, is two in the weeds, perhaps. Uh, 
or you can read a bit more about how that works if you're curious on the are we wiki. Um, the other side of this is say, well, okay, that's great. Now you can fit large amounts of data in a blockchain, but if no one's paid to replicate it, then, then you know, there's going to be a problem. And so what we created in, was essentially a decentralized endowment with a transparent risk model. So what we say is, okay, when you uh, pay to store data in our weekly, you pay for 200 years worth of data storage at the present cost of data storage. And then the deflationary effect of technology that humans are well incentivized to create, and we think uh, data encoding is one of those things that even before digital computers, humans have been on a sort of race to decrease the cost of data encoding over time. Um, yes, you can, you can bank on that essentially to provide you interest in the form of further storage purchasing power. So imagine at the beginning of the, the data storage period, at year zero, you put your data in, you pay for 200 years worth of storage at the present price. And at the end of year one, if the cost of data storage for encoding data uh, for a period of time has declined by more than 0.5%, you actually end up with a higher amount of storage purchasing power than you had at the beginning of the year, at the end of year one and the end of year two, and it goes on. Um, and so our idea is, okay, we need an economic system that will be viable for the length of time that the protocol is in use. We're trying to build a new paper. So we think that's a, you know, <laughs> uh, if we're doing very well, it's into the thousands of years, like early thousands of years. And so there are many different ways that you can um, track this and model it for yourself. Uh, but here's the output of one such model and basically says, okay, it looks at the cried up plus rate, that's the declining cost of storage over time or data encoding more specifically um, and longevity versus the, the volatility of token price. That's another thing that also factors into this. And you see all these green areas. This is where the, um, and this is over, I think, some number of runs, some large number of runs per cell in this, in this board um, using a Markov chain model, um, which you can check out online if you're curious about how it works. Um, and this green area is like the, the endowment would be sustainable for more than 10,000 years. And then when it's got a number that says the number of, or the, um, yeah, the number of years that it would run for. So it obviously can't go forever, forever, but it can go well past the lifetime of the, uh, the technical protocol. And our theory is that because the data set will be relatively small, uh, because you pay for 200 years worth of storage, um, you you essentially end up with a highly valuable concentrated data set that someone will find useful to hoover up into whatever the next uh, data archiving solution is in thousands of years or hundreds or you know, however long it actually happens to be. But the critical thing about Arweave is that this is this is a risk model, thank you. Like it, it is, um, could be wrong, but it's completely open and transparent and you can decide for yourself to what degree you trust it. And that's really the, the kind of beauty of the system is you, it allows you access to a business model that is immutable, can never be changed because it's in a blockchain. And um, yes, and transparent, you can always audit it and see how it's going. I think right now we have you know, payment for a significant amount longer than 200 years in the endowment. So uh, if you're curious about that, you can scan this uh, QR code and it goes to a page that, that goes into the details of how this works. Um, there's about, uh, this was a little bit, Oh no, no, this is this is a recent. Yeah, there's about 120 terabytes of data in here at the moment, uh, but is replicated, as I said, in hundreds and hundreds of places across the world. So it's a small data set, highly replicated is, is what we're going for. Um, it's used, there were about 70 million pieces of data from the first two weeks of the Ukraine war that uh, someone archived onto the system, or actually it was a team of people archived onto the system. And there are similar things from Hong Kong and so on. So people are building it to create these archives. Uh, the PermaWeb is all of the information inside this exposed in people's web browsers. And I'm conscious of time here, so I'll go a little bit quickly. But it makes a global permanent web. And the, the applications in the system, well, applications of data, right, fundamentally, uh, they're quite interesting because they're ownerless. So you can do things like create the Arwiki itself, which is a community-governed space. There is no higher authority than the community itself. The person that runs this server you see here it's on rwiki.wiki, but you could just replace that with another Arweave gateway and it would render the same application. And that application is permanent and out of the control of any individual. So this is like a really fundamentally different type of application that's enabled by the system that we hope can lead to a freer web. Obviously, of course, you can also use it for things like social media um, because it now enables you to have a sort of 
guaranteed right to speech in cyberspace. And I'll skip a few slides, but one thing I, I thought was interesting to highlight here was Silo, which is an extension to Arby using Tor and potentially Oxen and ITP and, and other um, onion routing type protocols on top. Uh, and this allows you to have encrypted web apps. So this, this slide sort of makes it simple to understand what it's doing. Um, unlike just using Tor, which is great on as, uh, would you say, on its own for, for obfuscating who is communicating with who, this also allows you to have the data that is being stored. So the web application is stored in an encrypted form. And if you don't know the name of the web application, it may as well not exist. Even though, um, yes, uh, even though it is actually retrievable and executable on your, on your machine. And so this is a little bit different than just uh, what is possible on the dark web. And that is enabled by things like uh, Tor. So we're, we're thankful to be able to build on, <laughs> uh, um, build on the protocols of giants, I guess there. Yes, so if you'd like to learn more, please check out arweave.org. And uh, one like, final thing, I'm definitely not the CEO of Arweave. <laughs> it really makes me wince when people say that. <laughs> I, I just founded it in the first place. It has no CEO, it's a, uh, it's a decentral, fully decentralized network. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thanks a lot, Sam. That was incredibly informative. Sorry for the CEO. I must say it was a it was a reputable. Uh, it's quite all right. <laughs> that made a mistake that led me to a mistake. Uh, no problem but yeah, this was this was really interesting. I think that at least with with your presentation, there are two very obvious topics that will emerge uh, in the discussion here. Uh, one of which being the sustainability of the project that you're building. Uh, a lot of people here have built uh, either uh, nonprofit organizations or foundations to kind of keep an organizational structure to keep going at the type of technology, for example. And uh, there are different approaches uh, to uh, how to ensure uh, sustainability in the centralized networks, especially. And we even have a question already in the Q&A uh, for that, but we'll get back to it. And I can imagine also the screams of some lawyers at the idea of information that is permanently there forever, uh, uh, as uh, probably uh, uh, some information asymmetry needs to be uh, rectified there to understand what exactly cannot be um, uh, deleted, what if it's really bad information. So the obvious question. Um, okay, great. Uh, I think we can move on to Roger. Roger, if you're ready. Yeah, sounds great. So hi, everybody. I'm Roger Dingledine from Tor. Uh, we're a nonprofit, smaller than Internet Archive, but uh, 30 or 40 or 50 people, depending on how you count it. And we're the communications layer. We've been hearing about storage layers so far today, and we're more about uh, private, safe, secure uh, communications. So I guess there are a bunch of different topics we can talk about, and I'll I'll talk a tiny bit about each one, and then we can ask more questions or get into the discussion. Uh, a couple of uh, backgrounds to Tor. So Tor is a network of volunteer relays around the world. We have 6,000 or 7,000 volunteers around the world who are relaying traffic for millions of Tor users each day. Uh, one of the important uh, fun things about Tor is the variety of users we have. We have ordinary people who read news articles about the NSA wiretapping, so they want more safety. We've got activists. We've got censored people in Russia and Iran and uh, France and so on. We've got militaries. We've got law enforcement. We've got governments. And all of these people are using the same Tor network. And that variety, that diversity is part of what it makes what makes it safe for everybody. You can't have a cancer survivor's anonymity system because then the fact that you're using it tells people about why you're using it. Uh, so there, there are two pieces to the metadata security that Tor provides. One of them is hiding where your traffic is coming from or going to on the network. So your IP address uh, layer of privacy. Uh, and that's what the, 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 the core proxy called Tor provides. And then the second piece of metadata security is Tor browser. It's the browser layer. It's the application layer. So all of the uh, things like cookies and fonts and uh, what version of JavaScript you've got and so on, uh, all of that can be identifiers for uh, recognizing you from connection to connection. 
So there are two pieces to what Tor does. The first one is uh, on the network trying to anonymize your connection. And the second one is at the application layer trying to, to make the application not have some cookie-like thing. So we, uh, we've been around for 20 years and a bit. And another fun topic we can talk about is the variety of funders we've had. We've been funded by the Electronic Frontier Foundation to do uh, freedom for the world. We've been funded by the National Science Foundation to try to understand how privacy and anonymity works and how, and, and how well we do at it and how to do better. We've been funded by the US State Department and the Swedish uh, foreign office for trying to help people around the world. So there's a, a, a variety of organizations out there who care about providing better metadata security. So one of the, the key things to think about in the Tor world, uh, how does this compare to like a centralized proxy or a VPN company or something like that? And one of the big differences is the, the way that Tor provides its security is through distributed trust or a decentralized network. So uh, some, some people like the phrase privacy by design rather than privacy by promise. So if you're using these centralized companies, they have all of your data and they promise not to screw you. So maybe they promise they don't write it down and then it turns out they do write it down or maybe they promise they won't sell it and then it turns out somebody buys their company and then the, the new people forgot about the old promise. So the goal in, in the tour world is there is no central point. There is no, there's no point at any place in the system that knows which users are talking to which website. So it's not about, uh, I promise I won't screw you. It's about the design of the system enforcing the privacy. So the relays are run by uh, volunteer community members around the world. We're pushing 300 gigabits of traffic on average, which is uh, every every month, every year, that number goes up. One of the other fun things to talk about is transparency from Tor side. So uh, we're we're huge fans of transparency. We give you our design documents, we give you our specifications, we give you the source code as free software, uh, and also we go around the world explaining, hi, I'm Roger from Tor, and I'm an actual person, and I'm happy to answer questions about Tor, um, and that community building is is key to why uh, Tor is trusted around the world. And I talk to a lot of people and, and they say, oh, haha, ha, the privacy people are talking about transparency. Ha ha, that's so stupid. Uh, it's not a contradiction. Privacy is about choice. And we choose to be transparent in order to build that strength, in order to build that community, in order to have people be able to know who we are uh, and know that they can trust us. So Andreas was talking uh, at the beginning about censorship resistance. And what does censorship resistance mean in the context of Tor? There are, I guess, three different pieces to it. One of them is uh, if you're somewhere in the world that you can't get to a website like archive.org, then you can use Tor and the Tor network and Tor browser to get around that censorship in order to get to the website you wanna to get to. So that's why a lot of people use Tor when BBC or something is blocked in the country uh, or the school or university or company or enterprise that they're in. And then the second thing, uh, when, when it comes to censorship and Tor, uh, because a lot of people use Tor to get around internet blocking, uh, countries start trying to block connections into the Tor network. So they try to make it hard for people around the world to use Tor in order to get this metadata security we were talking about. And there's a whole arms race we can talk about there uh, basically, the idea is uh, through uh, tools like bridges and pluggable transports, we try to transform Tor traffic into something that the sensor uh, can't recognize, doesn't want to block, doesn't think is related to Tor in a way that it can uh, get from where, wherever you are into the Tor network. Uh, so if you want to help with that, one of the pluggable transports is called Snowflake and you can install a browser extension that turns you into one of many tens of thousands of volunteers who are, trans, who are uh, handling traffic uh, from censored users into your browser and from there into the Tor network. Um, and then the last piece of, uh, of censorship is uh, the Tor Onion services. Uh, I think Sam briefly talked about uh, uh, ways of communication inside the Tor network. So, a lot of people want to run a website. 
So they have to get a DNS entry for their website. They have to get an IP address from RIPE or somebody. They have to go to a certificate authority and uh, get an HTTPS certificate. They have to go to ICANN and get a domain. Um, all of those are points of failure and points of control. So the goal of Tor Onion Services is to let people run services on the internet where they control their address and they don't have to rely on all these other uh, external, typically for-profit governmental organizations uh, caring about their priorities. And there are a bunch of high-profile high names like New York Times, BBC, Facebook, Cloudflare uh, that use and rely on Onion services. So Andreas was talking about uh, what are motivations here? So Tor is fundamentally about correcting power imbalances. Tor is more useful for people who don't have much power. So what motivates me on this is uh, talking to people around the world whose lives are different because of our tools, who, who have the ability to try to change their community, their country, their, their, their ecosystem, uh, because they have the safety to be able to speak out and to be able to learn. So as a last thought, there are a bunch of tools that people build on top of Tor. SecureDrop is a fun one. It's a whistleblowing platform that New York Times and Guardian and Washington Post and so on use to let uh, people who have information for the journalists reach them safely. Um, Onion Share is another fun one that uh, basically it's a, it's a simple file sharing mechanism that uses the Tor Onion service design uh, to transfer a file through the Tor network in a way that there's no long-term address, there's no long-term anything, uh, it all disappears after that. Uh, and another fun example of a tool that uses Tor is Open Archive, and I'm going to pass that to Natalie. Thanks, Roger. Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this Oxford Institute, Internet Institute. We really are so grateful to be here again amongst giants. Um, we have been building on Tor's tools for over about 10 years now, and I'm going to give a brief introduction, and I'd actually like to share some slides, so give me one moment. Thanks, Roger, for the, for the, uh, for the amazing presentation and for the very smooth transition. I couldn't yeah. have done it better yeah. myself. Best transition. Can you see them okay? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wonderful. All right, so I'm Natalie Cadronel. I'm the founder and executive director of Open Archive, a nonprofit that empowers and enables eyewitnesses to sh securely share, archive, verify, and encrypt their mobile evidentiary media. Um, it's wonderful to be here with two organizations that helped inspire this work, the Internet Archive and Tor. They helped enable the vision I had in 2013, after 15 years of being a media activist and four years of doing ethnographic research, that's right, I'm from the humanities, I'm not from the tech space, we realized technology was moving so far ahead of policy to protect activists, and people were starting to use tools like Redphone, which is now Signal, and it has come a long way since then, and my goal as a humanities person to come into the space was really to make these types of tools easier for us to use. As someone who believes in policy, but also saw that technology was really actually advancing human rights in a way that policy was falling behind and falling short to do the work of Tor and Witness and the Guardian Project at that time to create verifiable um, and privacy tools uh, for activists was really inspiring because the circles I was working in had a high demand for usable archiving tools that just didn't exist, um, especially around mobile. So towards these ends, I founded Open Archive in 2015 to create a space and tools to help activists more safely document and preserve their mobile media, often languishing or worse, being weaponized on social media. Um, so one of our primary goals is really to kind of reconcile the trade-offs between privacy and security and usability. And we work with communities worldwide um, and have been for over a decade to get extremely rich ethnographic research around their needs, their capacities, and their desires and, and kind of visions for how their archive will bring some justice, hopefully, and definitely accountability. Um, in the long run. And so we work with folks working with the ICC and 
um, other you know jurisdictions more locally in the U.S. to figure out like how media can be how evidentiary media can best be court admissible, which is challenging and evolving rapidly. Um, so it's wonderful to have the opportunity to join you all, and we really appreciate it. So um, a quick overview of what we do. We are working with human rights organizations, activists, archivists, eyewitnesses, legal observers, citizen reporters around the globe to do co-research and build responsive tools like SAVE, which I'll get to in a moment, um, and produce guides and best archival practices for evidentiary mobile media in white papers, blogs, collaborative papers, so that the research can get out there freely and openly. Um, we are fully open source. I may not have mentioned that, but you will learn more about SAVE in a moment. Before sharing more about the work, I wanna take a step back to discuss our approach. We center human rights throughout each stage of the research and development processes using the human rights center design methodology and curriculum. So uh, Roger had mentioned privacy by design. I would like to say that we are now moving into a human rights by design space. I think the activist communities have been looking for guideposts, including myself and many folks in the space where we just didn't have anyone to lead the way to say, this is how you build a tool for activists in a way where you're not helicoptering in. I have done co-research and co-design within activist communities, not without, for so long that I felt like we needed to be heard. Like the people who are actually suffering and actually needing these tools, like can't use most of the ones that are thrown at them by big tech. And when they do, they're often, um, it, it's it's detrimental. And so we thought, wouldn't it be great not to just create a curriculum and methodology for within the space, but hopefully to share it with civil society, government and corporate uh, society out you know, more widely to help get people to understand that this is a fundamental, um, a fundamental consideration when you're building anything because ultimately downstream at-risk users are always going to use the technology. So please check that out. Um, hopefully someone dropped it in the chat, the link. It is evolving. It will be on Gitbook soon. So it will be a collaborative space going forward and hopefully it will evolve for many, many years to come with all of your wonderful input and, and whatnot. Um, all right. And so I think... Um, one one big goal of this, just to just to finish this piece up, and I'd love to expand this conversation further. This talk is not about uh, human rights centered design. That is just an aside, but it is a very large topic. And since I'm in an academic space today, we'd love to talk with people who are interested in teaching it, contributing to it, and learning more about it. Um, the goal is to bring harm reduction and forethought from siloed human rights spaces to the tool building space at large. All right, so so the activist communities we work with, we have, we have dubbed them the decentralized archivist communities. As we move into this interesting space of decentralization and Web3, um, we, we, we work with them, we give them direct funding, we are able to do co-research and design with them through these collaborations and offer archival technical and privacy expertise, as well as our tools and workshops and guides. Um, we currently have decentralized archivist community partners on almost every continent. Through our work with these DACs, we are learning and sharing real world challenges and opportunities around evidentiary archiving in order to amplify their causes and make more responsive tools that better meet their needs. One of the DACs that we are incredibly lucky to work with is the Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group in Ukraine. Since beginning our work with them in April of 2022, we've been so inspired by their resilience and their brilliant team who've already created a robust, secure evidentiary archive over the last decade. We have now worked with them to kind of extend their work to mobile so that all the media they're receiving from folks from their mobile phones is now gonna come through one channel versus like 30. And they're really grateful for, um, for the work we do. And we've worked to really understand their challenges through our needs assessments and help them meet their archival goals by providing them with workshops, trainings, and also tailoring our tool SAVE to meet their needs. So what is the SAVE business I've been talking about all this time? So. So SAVE is our secure mobile archiving app. It's an acronym. It stands for Share, Archive, Verify, and Encrypt. And it does employ the services of the Internet Archive as one optional backend. Many of our users need much more private backends, so it's web app compatible. You can use servers, open source servers like NextCloud or OwnCloud that are committed to privacy, security, and long-term preservation. You can also do it air-gapped if your media is so sensitive it should not be on the Internet at all. And it offers a suite of responsive features like verification and privacy um, and connects users to decentralized and redundant private and public backends. 
So it streamlines secure preservation based on community input and our commitment to digital inclusion, privacy, and human rights. And I didn't prepare a technical demo for you all, although I realized after watching everyone's presentations, it's actually the right crowd for that. So please get in touch. I have a lot more to share on this um, if you'd like to do that after the after the uh, the conference. So one question. So our biggest questions right now are there's so much excitement about decentralization, so much trepidation about these technologies. And you know, with activists and archival spaces, there's always an ever-growing need for these types of uh, these decentralized redundant backends because how many of us have lost something because our phone died or our hard drive died or we didn't put it in enough places, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we have more capability now than ever to make sure that data loss doesn't happen. And yet, you know, our phones are so fragile and that is where so much of this media resides. So we're really excited about expanding our backends to include like IPFS and Filecoin to, to really help verify and provide a chain of custody for this media. And yet we have some pretty big questions and concerns because while verification and authentication is core to our mission and to the way we help people you know, use their media for accountability, it can put them at risk. Uh, so what kinds of metadata and information should not be shared and should not be on the blockchain? And how can we ensure that those who are you know, adding media to this decentralized space aren't inadvertently exposing themselves or others? Or what if someone's face in the, in the video or the, you know, the photo might be easily recognizable with the amazing AI that's happening and you know, deep fakes and all these things? So we think about this and we're really hoping to have some answers for you if you're also thinking about this. Let us know. Um, you know, we we love to be able to utilize the benefits of the D-Web and also avoid pitfalls. So these are some of our questions. And honestly, maybe I, I zoomed through this too fast. I don't know if anyone wants to have any discussions. I know we're going to open it up later, but I think the affordances of various decentralized storage technologies. Um, we'd really like to do kind of an, an audit and decide like, what do we really like about it and really understand what other people are kind of, uh, you know, what other concerns folks are having in this space. And I apologize, my face is not on today. I tend to keep my face off the internet for my own reasons. <laughs> as, as you know, my work is fairly sensitive. I was kind of high level today for specific reasons. Um, I'm always happy to have sidebars and I wish I could see your faces and engage with you the way we all are. And someday I hope there will be a way. Um, but for now, this is the best I could do. So thank, yeah. Thank you so much, Natalie. One last slide. Yeah, Get in ahead. touch with us. Here are all of our, our links. Learn more about us. I'd love to connect with folks in, in this space on this panel afterwards. And also, you know, during this time, I really think these are some pressing questions that we're all working around. And since we've kind of come up as the usability for privacy tools space um, and the research space, I think that I'd love to collate our work with others doing similar work around this because these tools are amazing and extremely powerful. Um, but I think we do really need to throw a lot more resources at making them so easy to use that everyone's just gonna use them seamlessly in the future. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you so much. I, I'm glad we finished with your presentation uh, actually because you, you, you represent so well the stack that I was trying to to uh, to gather here with uh, with the different panelists, show that uh, you know you have at the protocol level, you have relayers, you have uh, uh, the type of cryptography that you use. That is also you know some open source framework that uh, some random person in Alaska is working on, and so many of the projects uh, here today depend on work that is done in a completely decentralized way, in the sense that. Yeah. There are a lot of organizations, individuals, uh, teams that are working on the components that make us all safer and more private uh, on the internet today. So with that, I think we can open the discussion uh, for a more free form uh, conversation. We have a few questions already in the Q&A. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wait for a few seconds to see if anybody wants to, uh, um, to start with a question, uh, having heard each other. Uh, maybe you have uh, some pressing uh, pressing concern or questions in your mind. Yes, Lori, already. Actually, I was going to start uh, with you if nobody uh, took the, um, the conversation. I just want to highlight 
one quote by Lori that I keep in mind whenever I ask people about where they think that their efforts should go in regards to internet freedom. And I was explaining to Lori, okay, this is a research I'm doing on government surveillance. And she told me that, yes, research is good, but litigation is better. And it's something that I keep in mind uh, for, okay, there are better ways of achieving the goals that I want to achieve. So please, Lori. Um, thank you so much for uh, for the different presentations. And um, I realize Open Archive is is probably what is missing in my um, in my uh, tools actually, because <clears throat> a few months ago we were talking with a uh, with a group of um, of strategic litigators, and the conversation came towards evidence. And I can only echo what you just said about um, how difficult it actually is to produce uh, good quality evidence to a court. Uh, and this is amazing because uh, in 2020, we actually had this enormous um, case around uh, US and uh, international surveillance. Uh, so the Shrimps 2 case. And in that case, in the ruling, the highest uh, court of the EU turned to all the data protection regulators in the EU and said, you guys are just not doing bad enough. Uh, mm -hmm. You can do better in terms of investigations. And this is really strong for people like me because when people tell me, oh, do I have good enough uh, evidence? Right now I can just say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We just need to sign post and ask for an investigation. And this is where Tor, this is where um, this is where the Wayback Machine come handy because this is what I'm doing. And we're just looking discreetly for things, breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs are enough. And then we ask for an investigation. And this is also where I think uh, the Open Archive is uh, is coming in the picture. So uh, thank you so much for that presentation. So yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to really stress this because yeah, I I arrive in the picture in the background because thanks to tools like the ones that you're you're maintaining, we are really strong when we when we hit the regulator with a complaint uh, to explain that yes the business is saying no no we're training our algorithm on the data but we have no access to data whatsoever etc uh, this is really strong for us because then we can sprinkle some signposting to po to post that used to be on the on the business website etc etc and uh, the investigators um, and the notaries within the data protection authority will pick this up but, yeah thanks okay. Yeah, we have heard so much frustration from the um, <laughs> from the court space. I think without eyewitnesses on the stand, evidentiary media is almost useless, and it can be really challenging to verify. And we have these tools, and I think it's a matter of reconciling this gap um, between the courts and yeah, the media. On, on, on this point of uh, challenges, I, I wanted to ask maybe uh, briefly uh, each uh, uh, panelist. It, in the projects that you've helped uh, build and uh, and deliver to the world, I I'm guessing that uh, maybe it's a wrong guess, but that the um, technology is probably where you see less challenges emerge in the sense that uh, at least most uh, nonprofits that I talk to or people that are building in the open tell me that the biggest problem is thinking about how to make it sustainable, how to have more people adopt it, adopt it in a way that makes sense uh, uh, for their local reality or their personal uh, um, their uh, personal context. So if they're at risk or if they're in a bad region, uh, are there challenges that uh, pop up in your mind when you think of, OK, I'm somebody entering in uh, in uh, the world of uh, Internet freedom. I want to start a project. Is there something that you can give as a highlight? Okay, this is one of the issues or challenges you always have to, uh, you're, you recurrently uh, see. I've got one fun example on the communication side. Uh, so one of the, we started off with Tor. We, we try to build a tool that can keep everybody in the internet safe. Uh, turns out that's hard, but what's harder is making browsers actually respect privacy. So it started off with us saying, 
uh, you, it's your problem to attach your browser to this thing. Good luck doing that successfully. And then we realized nobody was doing that. So we uh, basically forked Firefox and we maintain our own Tor browser with our own big pile of patches to, to, uh, to make Firefox be more privacy respectful. And we'd like to do that with Chrome and Safari and WebKit and so on, but they're not open source. So uh, they're designed to be hard to make safe which is super frustrating. Uh, but the, the way to spin this into a more cheerful thing is that we've actually been uh, successfully getting Mozilla to take some of the patches we've made and transition the fixes that we have into their browser. And at the same time, uh, we're not directly fixing Safari and Chrome, but there's pressure on them to make safer browsers, browsers that respect privacy. So the, 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 the win condition, the end game from that perspective is that we've made the mainstream browsers good enough because I don't want to maintain a browser. That's crazy talk, like maintaining a browser in your spare time that nobody wants to do that. So uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, what we need to do is, is change the landscape of the, the more mainstream apps so that they do uh, things that protect people. Absolutely. I, I honestly, I want to echo that. I think a lot of the challenge is that the network effect has brought people to these five platforms and there's so many more amazing tools out there, but either people are not aware of them or they're very hard to use. And that's why I think there really needs to be many, many more people in kind of the usability and research space so that we can co-research and localize tools for the communities that need it most and really understand where their challenges are so that we can do better with our tech and hopefully upstream it to the, you know, all tech. Um, but absolutely, I think adoption is always challenging. I think if you're working with the groups like I am, where this tool came out of a need, um, we weren't really envisioning the tool. We were looking at the resources we had, like the Internet Archive and Tor and other things at the time. There was a clear need for secure transfer of media, of mobile media. And there were, you know, a lot of challenges. And once we were able to provide the tool, even though it, you know, it took years to get to a place where it was highly usable, people were using it, even if it was hard to use <laughs> because the because Google was blocked and they couldn't send anything to YouTube, let's say in Iran or Sudan. So they were able to send things to the Internet Archive in the early iteration of our app. And I think people come um, when you really are working at the grassroots level in a way that respects and, and understands them and don't helicopter in and, and really have the trust bond with the people you're working with. And for us, it's a pretty small sector of society. But in my opinion, it's one of the most important sectors. So that was, you know, that's a challenge we always face. And that's one way we've, we've helped overcome it. So I've got a long list of, of challenges. Um, here are some of the ones that um, I think about. One is policy and law. Uh, I noted uh, that the, uh, the BBC DMCA'd uh, their own video about Modi. Um, you know, people wondering about that. There's an article in Boing Boing um, about that. Um, you know, the Indian government also has been taking actions relative to that, but um, but in this case, uh, you know, the BBC DMCA their own video. The general ephemerality of much of media today, um, the ephemerality by design um, in systems and, and platforms. Uh, paywalls. Uh, I've cataloged about 170,000 news sites in the world. I archive uh, many of them, uh, but a growing number, especially of high quality uh, journalism, is behind a paywall. It's uh, it's been said that the the lies uh, the the truth is paywalled, but the lies are are free. Uh, how do you know what's there? Uh, how do you how do you archive something if you don't even know it exists? There's no centralized. Uh, uh, directory of everything that humans publish on every platform. Uh, uh, things change. Uh, the, the, there's the, the the inherent ephemerality uh, and um, of of the net. You've got the this breakdown between an address space and the content associated with it. Uh, you can't step in the same river river twice. Uh, the 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 idea of having something in one place versus many places is a, a principle in archiving called locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe, and much of the conversation here about decentralization begins to address some of that. But many of those, frankly, don't scale well. Uh, you know, the Internet Archive has been a pioneer in the decentralized web space. We've been holding summits and webinars and 
uh, you check out getdweb.org, uh, I think it is, or getdweb.net. Um, and we, we've we been hosting camps, the Decentralized Web Camp. Uh, we've done three of them. we got one coming up. I encourage people to come to it. Hundreds of people come to those and explore a range of, of these topics that we're, we're talking um, about. Uh, Facebook itself, uh, Facebook, you know, uh, proudly proclaims on their website that they've got something like 100 engineers that are working hard to thwart the efforts of people who are trying to archive the material there. And I've worked with many, many fact-checking organizations around the world to try to do a better job of archiving uh, Facebook. It's hard to hold uh, platforms uh, and, and others accountable if, if, you're, if you're not able to document uh, what's going on there. Accountability is, has to do with provenance. Um, you know, I know, Laura, you spoke about that, I think, a, a, a bit here. Like, how do you know where something came from? How can you demonstrate, uh, you know, and uh, in, in a reliable fashion? I will say that there are hundreds of cases in which uh, evidence from the Wayback Machine has been admissible in courts uh, and, and even at, at international level. So I, I, I don't buy that. Uh, we must have cryptographically signed uh, provenance in order for things to be um, uh, you know, uh, made, made available. In some cases, sure, that might be the case, but I don't want to get hung up on. Uh, let's not be perfection with the enemy of, of the uh, good here. Context writ large, uh, you know, more and more of the material. My nightmare scenario right now to think about is that I'm going to wake up to a world in which uh, the vast majority of what media, uh, what people consume in their information uh, diet is AI generated, AI generated by bad actors, be they corporate or government control. Uh, you know, it's bad enough that it's human uh, uh, bad actor generated content. Uh, but what about AI generated content with lack of provenance? Chat GPT, for example, on the one hand, I'm it's like changing my life and I'm loving it and I see the future. On the other hand, it's like there's zero provenance and it constantly changes. So it's ephemeral. There's no context. I'm like, I don't know. Like, did you hear the same thing I heard? Where did that come from? Who made that? I don't know. It's a, a bit of, of, of a problem here. And uh, oh, yeah, technology itself, media. I mean, I mean, I'm just having a I'm spending hours and hours of engineering time just trying to archive some video published by the U.S. government publishing office because of the particular kind of cloud flare based streaming technology that they're using and then piecing it all together on the back end. So the devil's in the uh, details. And uh, so, so that's a, a brief introduction to some of the challenges um, that uh, we work with at the Internet Archive on a daily basis. Perhaps to just jump on the on the bandwagon there, <laughs> I definitely agree with the, this question of um, what if we wake up in a world where there's sort of a uh, a hostile web, basically where almost everything we read is AI generated. I think that is that is likely, and it makes provenance very important. Um, I think that there's, I think that frankly, the structure of the web is likely to change so much that 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 almost might not be the that there will be an interim stage, but that's the problem. The, the problem that comes after that will be different, is my guess. Um, the way that I see it is, is that the, let's say the user agents, the things acting on behalf of the user as, as HTTP defines it, uh, are likely to become more and more intelligent. And you see this already, like Google is starting to rip information out of the web pages and bring it into the search results, search results. And so they're no longer search results, right? It's actually just you're kind of like querying the big blob of human knowledge. And yeah, that's going to create even more provenance questions. Like you can really imagine that that might end in a situation where you're sort of just asking the general cloud of human knowledge out there, hey, what's the answer to this question? And it's just bringing forward the, uh, a good guess. And yeah, that's going <laughs> to see a million other problems with that. But at least with provenance, yeah, that, that's exactly actually why Arweave is structured like a ledger. Um, the the idea is okay well every time you say something it should really just be an assertion so it's i claim something to be true at this point in time with this metadata and and it should be clear who i am and it should be clear um yeah when i said it and it should also be clear you know you say what the context was i think that's really important and that that's something that's built into the design of arweave as for what it's worth is a uh, scalability so arweave uses uh Instead of trying to make it so that you can you can create many different 
say files with different storage terms and this type of thing, um, as some of the earlier storage systems did, Arweave just has one storage term and one data pile. And you can add to that data pile. And when you add, you pay. Um, but this means that we can make it hyperscalable. So you, you can put as much data as you want in a single transaction on Arweave. And because it's all the same data term, there's no difference between your data and my data. So we can actually bundle it together. Uh, and that's the, the key unlock. That requires you to do some sort of, yeah, trying not to get into the nuance, but like to get around the double spend problem, you have to you know, delegate a small amount of trust, but say you're archiving like $5 worth of information at a time, you just, you just do that and, and it's, not a, it's not a big deal, but it means it's arbitrarily scalable and you can store the scale of the web. Um, so that's kind of problem of the past for us, but, but I certainly do see this, this question of the provenance of information is going to be important. And, and I guess the other challenge I would throw in there is uh, let's not let a free web become illegal because it seems to me like across the world, you know, I've been watching because I'm from Britain, but I, I no longer live there. Um, the quote, internet safety bill, unquote, has very little to do with internet safety and everything to do with controlling the information that the population is able to access. And, and I see that that pattern is replicating itself in many supposedly free countries, all for the, for the, let's say, dubious question of attempting to rid the information, the information space of disinformation. But, well, classic question, who gets to decide what the disinformation is? <laughs> there are many things that my government publishes that I, I think is largely disinformation. Um, same deal with terrorists, right? One person's terrorist and one person's freedom fighter. In fact, so much was that the case in in the Syrian conflict that in the US, a Democrat put forward a law that said, stop funding terrorists was the name of the law. <laughs> and I think we have the same problem with disinformation. Um, it's really in the eye of the beholder. And so I would argue strongly that, you know, as people advocating for a free web, we need to be out front and say, look, yeah, it's difficult that we have to deal with a world where there's information that is untrue passing or floating around all the time. And perhaps actually the internet has made that wider there's now a far wider lens of the information that people are exposed to rather than the small media space that existed before the free internet did. But I, I just can't see us going. I, I just really hope that we do not go back to a world where there is a small number of information authorities. Instead, we should be building tools that help people highlight what is true and work out together. It's like collective sense-making tools should be the focus, as well as on the policy side, trying to advocate for the fact that what we advocate for the, the ability to be responsible adults and, and try and make up our own minds about what is true in the world rather than having centralized bodies telling us what we can and cannot believe or can and cannot be exposed to such that we know what to believe. Anyway, yeah. thank you. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, Laurie, you had your, your hand up. Uh, I'm conscious you, uh, you, you. But I'm to... conscious of time. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I'm we're going to have to do an uh, uh, internet freedom part two uh, uh, meeting. <laughs> but uh, yes, please go ahead. All right. Uh, well, I, uh, I wanted to add a very meta point, actually, building on your point, Grant. And actually, Sam, you have absolutely followed that thought. So, Andres, you had this question, most urgent problems with the internet. So... I think this ties with the question of provenance, which is uh, where I'm taking this to maybe a bit of a more meta level, which is <clears throat> today we don't really have international uh, international law rules around if you have if you harm someone somewhere around the globe through uh, digital means, you have to repair that harm. And this is something very problematic, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and typically, to take the example of provenance, I really agree with uh, Privacy International when uh, when we raised the alarm that the issue of hacking is enormous because we're, it's not about it's not just about <clears throat> intercepting data; it's also about changing it or deleting it. And this is something extremely scary uh, for for people like me. Maybe maybe uh, Mark, this is an issue that you guys have thought much more about. But this is also your point, Sam, about creating a ledger of information. I think this is something very reassuring for someone like me because the fact that uh, at the moment uh, people that build, sell, and use hacking tools face pretty much no accountability um, from from even a, 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 an information uh, protection and provenance perspective. 
is very concerning um, in terms of the, the world that we're building together. That will be my last point. Thank you, Andreas. So I just want to say a couple of comments. The first of all, this, this conversation should include Wikimedia Foundation and on the Wikipedia sites, the 320 Wikipedia sites. They give me hope. Uh, and uh, and I just I just can't say enough good things about the work of the hundreds of thousands of human beings around the planet that are working to build uh, knowledge repositories uh, with providence and you know good uh, backup and and a, and a process and, and the rest of that. I, I I'm working on a, a general purpose context engine. I just throw it out there if anyone would like to follow me about that. Uh, there's an, an old blog post that I wrote a couple of years ago that I think is being shared here with everyone. Uh, it's got about 10,000 key value pairs in it right now, but in a, about a month or two, it should have a few hundred thousand uh, key value pairs. And um, uh, the, the basic idea is that uh, for anything that can be accessed via URL, which at this point is a lot of stuff um, across a variety of, of media, uh, it, it would be useful to be able to know uh, relative to that URL various perspectives. Uh, there, there may be uh, metadata. That may be this. This uh, that journal was retracted uh, by a publication. It may be that uh, this uh, the 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 uh, the post was taken down by a platform. It may be that it was edited. There was revisions to it. It may be that it had been uh, fa quote unquote fact checked by some uh, third party organization. Uh, it may have been subject to censorship. You know, it, basically metadata about data uh, that could be expressed through URLs uh, in a general purpose. Uh, kind of format is the idea of the project that we're working on, one of the projects working on at, at the Internet Archive. Very interesting. I, I shared the link also in the chat. Um, we have uh, seven minutes left, uh, so I'm going to uh, try the impossible and uh, uh, launch a last quick conversation. So actually, anything you would like to highlight uh, as panelists, as uh, especially anything that is directed towards uh, members of the public, uh, uh, things that would improve their security or privacy online or their ability to uh, find uh, the knowledge and information that they want, uh, preserve it. I know that all the projects that we highlighted today are responses already to that question, uh, to that question but anything that you would like to highlight in terms of tools or approaches to how you are online, please, uh, this is your moment. I'll jump in with one that's been bothering me, which is the centralization of the internet. And I view that as a threat. There are a couple of content providers, Akamai and Cloudflare. And if they decide not to serve a country, uh, then that country is not on the internet anymore. There are a couple of uh, undersea cables that go between continent and continent. And whoever controls those decides uh, connectivity of how the internet works. There are a couple of browsers, and if they decide not to have a feature, you don't have that feature. There are a couple of mobile providers, uh, Apple and Google, and and together they have their own app stores. Mm -hmm. So the, the world is way more concentrated in power, uh, and that, that leads to fragility and brittleness. So, I mean, we're all fans of decentralization here, but but that that centralization is the is the big threat that I see. So, so I just offer a few things. First of all, uh, thank you, Andreas, for sharing that URL, uh, semitisonline.org. It's uh, not affiliated with the Internet Archive per se, but uh, I think it's it's very interesting to take a look at what they're doing to help uh, people around the world get access to information uh, from trusted news sources that they might not otherwise be able to get access to because of. Uh, nation state uh, technology blocking efforts. The, uh, you know, I noted uh, earlier that, that the, the Modi film got DMCA'd uh, by the BBC, but also the Indian government uh, is, uh, is sending out communications to hundreds of platforms. Uh, and, you know, we operate, uh, like it or not, in many cases in a, a world of, of law and, uh, and of, of control of much of the technology, the core technologies of the internet. The bottom line is that countries can block access. Uh, you know, the Internet Archive was fined last year by the by the Russian government. 
uh, over some material. Uh, the Internet Archive has been the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive have been blocked uh, at various times by various governments around the world uh, for various reasons, um, including some commercial reasons, uh, not just, you know, for political reasons. So, you know, that you say, well, um, Let's decentralize everything, and uh, and there will be no control. That causes concern as well. I, I I have no. There's no easy answers for me, at least. I mean, I watch Dark Mirror, and uh, you know the uh, the idea of a completely un uh, controlled communications platform. Human beings haven't done really well with uh, with technology with unlimited power will probably destroy ourselves as a civilization in a nuclear war in in in, in the short term i i'm fairly pessimistic about this point uh and and communications a uh, you know pretty dangerous uh powerful tool that we have available and we're not demonstrating a, a maturity or sensibility of dealing with it in a responsible fashion by and large i know maybe for one of you say this he's gone off his rock with his heresy but uh it it does concern me when these decentralized platforms uh, may be used to uh, to carry, distribute uh, uh, information and material that may well be very harmful and dangerous to people. So let's leave it at that. With great power comes great responsibility. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a challenge. A mix of pessimistic and optimistic outlook uh, there, uh, but uh, but I completely understand what you mean. And just to relate it back to something that Roger was mentioning, I was thinking actually of inviting also uh, someone maybe for next talk on uh, setting up internet infrastructure uh, in different uh, cities, countries, mesh networks. And this is personally something I'm very hopeful about. I was in Barcelona not too long ago. I saw uh, some people from the GUIFI net uh, a team that are setting up a, a mesh network uh, in Barcelona. It was really, really uh, nice to see. Uh, I just echo yeah. mesh networks as a really inspirational localized um, way to have consistent internet in, in areas where there's no connectivity. So glad someone mentioned it. Thank you. Um, any last concluding words that uh, you would like to share? Any recommendations, advice uh, for people's safety, privacy, and any way they can uh, help you join this fight uh, on uh, improving the state of internet freedom? Please do. I would only say very briefly that it seems to me, and I'm you know, relatively young, I didn't see the very early days of the web, but it seems to me that the time of most criticality is, is approximately now. Uh, so, so if you have an interest in keeping the web free, uh, then now is the time to, to, to act and do something about it. There's many different things to do, but you know, <laughs> that don't wait until it's too late, I would say. <clears throat> I just put a plug in for the organization APC Association for Progressive Communications.org, working around the world on uh, internet rights and, and access issues. Also put a plug in for Peter Gabriel's new song, uh, Panopticom, uh, on his album, uh, I.O. will be going on tour in a few months. He dedicated the song to witness.org and to Bell and Cat and to uh, Forensic Architects. It's little known uh, that Peter Gabriel was the co-founder of witness.org and is very, very active uh, in this space. Uh, and uh, he's also the uh, help start APC.org uh, more than 30 years ago. Amazing. Yes, Lori. Um, yeah, maybe also to finish on thinking about what you were saying, Sam. Um, I've done research now and I realized that uh, freedom of information rules are actually really new. And typically uh, it's only since 2018 that every country in the European Union has a law around this, which is really interesting because these are really strong levers for accountability. And so I would also want to plug in uh, the website whatdotheyknow.com because it enables people to uh, do subject, uh, sorry, not subject access requests, this is GDPR, uh, freedom of information requests and they become public by default. And I know I'm using this a lot, Privacy International is using this a lot. Um, so this also gives us data to then 
uh, build our cases from. So yeah, just uh, just to add this. Thank you. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much to uh, to everyone. I think that uh, I'm overextending uh, a little bit here. I, I'm sad that I didn't organize this a bit better in the sense that I should have booked uh, three hours at least uh, uh, for the discussion to go on. And I think if we were all in the same uh, building or room, it would have gone uh, over even longer. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I, I can't tell you all how much I respect uh, the work that you do, uh, what uh, what you've built already, your experiences. And I'm your I'm a big fan, and uh, it was really a pleasure to to get the opportunity to have you discuss among yourself, but also share so much uh, uh, of your knowledge, experiences, uh, advice uh, with um, with our guests today, with uh, uh, all the people that registers uh, registered for today's talk. So um, thanks again. I hope we'll be able to make a, a second one, a second installation of this uh maybe physically uh this time uh i'll do my best but um again thank you so much and um have a great day <laughs>